Hello everyone. My name is Kamal Manocha. I represent PMS AIF World. Over the last five years, today, you know, we have reached a level that we can very confidently say that the kind of platform that we conceptualized has been kind of adding a lot of value to our clients and mostly in the space of equities because there have been plenty of equity fund managers who have been delivering a lot of alpha and we have been discovering them, interviewing them, building our conviction, building conviction of our clients and bringing them through these webinars. We take the you know process ahead. Now equity markets kind of have rallied a lot in the overall you know portfolio of any client as per asset allocation. Debt also plays a very significant role. Hence, we thought of discovering some of the alpha focused fund managers in the space of private credit funds. And in that particular space, today we have Mr. Rakshat Kapoor, who is the CIO at Modulus Alternates. He's the part of founding team, kind of a founder himself uh, of this fund. This is the second series of the fund, uh, you know, which we'll be talking about today. There has been a six years of track record and a stellar track record. We have seen a lot of our clients who were skeptical five years ago when the first series of the fund was running and we gave money to this fund and we have seen more than 50% of money has already come back and the client's experience is very good. And now when you know they have already raised almost 500 crores in the new fund, we thought of doing this detailed webinar with Rakshat to understand the entire private credit space, how modulus alternates is actually adding a lot of value to this particular segment. So to begin with, Rakshat, you know, I would want you to first address to our audience that what is the overall industry, you know, all about. Please explain, you know, what is the entire private credit space? What are the various products that are available? And obviously, you know, different products offer different risk return dynamics. We will understand over this webinar, how is your product kind of positioned? But let us understand what is the entire space all about in terms of risk return dynamics from investors point of view. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kamal. For, so first, uh, hello, everyone. And I think it's always great to uh, speak on some of these platforms. And I think I'm thanks to AFPMS and Kamal and team that have given us an opportunity to come and speak to all of you. Uh, we have been sort of running uh, this private credit fund. Obviously, we have done fund one. Now we are doing fund two. So there is a bit of experience that we have. So I'm going to just speak on, um, you know, uh, since we are on fundraising in fund two. So yeah, I often come across this question as to as landscape in private credit is becoming bigger and wider and a lot of funds are there. So how do we, how is the landscape really structured? Um, what are the different type of funds? and who's doing what, etc. So that also gives a sense of, um, you know, how should sort of investors uh, select certain kind of credit funds based on their risk return uh, aspiration or profile. So firstly, if I just sort of take a little bit of genesis uh, around private credit, if you look at uh, broadly, I would say that there are uh, three categories of private credit funds that are uh, sort of currently that are being run as the credit strategy. The first category is really the performing credit segment in which uh, the, the credit strategy or the investment strategy of the funds has been to invest in companies which are fundamentally performing in nature. Obviously, there is, uh, you know, uh, there is a subjectivity in the definition of performing to each fund. But by and large, or I would say broadly, what it means is that the companies that you invest in are, are performing, which, which is up and running, established, profitable, around for a long time, etc. So that's really the performing credit funds category uh, based on the, you know, uh, risk return. That's a, uh, this is sort of a category one is what you would say where the risk uh, in investment in performing credit as an asset class is obviously lowest in the in the in the pecking order the next category is really the kind of funds which are focused more around uh, special situation kind of transactions 
uh, or special situation kind of, uh, you know, uh, situations in which these companies are sort of going through and then it sort of comes to credit funds to seek capital. So these are sort of situations where there is, uh, you know, they're predicated on what you, how do you define special situations is where the uh, exits or where the investment hypothesis is really based on certain event driven episodes. So that's how you sort of define uh, special situations. And really the last category is really the distressed category where I think the, the credit managers or the investment strategy is really focused around uh, picking up companies which are uh, real turnaround situations or for that matter have, are going through a process of uh, heightened level of stress or non-performing in nature. What I'm trying to explain is that uh, there are a variety of credit funds uh, today uh, in the market and everybody is sort of running quite uh, at a good strategy. But everybody is sort of, I would say, is broadly falling into three buckets. As I said, uh, you know, uh, performing uh, special situations and distressed category. So when you look at these funds, I think it is very important for you to sort of understand as to what is the fundamental investment approach of the uh, fund manager and of the investment strategy and how is the fund really built around in terms of the various hypotheses around these investments. Uh, and based on the risk return, I would say that performing uh, category really sort of focuses on companies which um, uh, ignoring sort of uh, keeping a risk aside. I think the return profiles are generally between, I would say, 12 to 15 percent. Special situations is, I would say, more like 15 to 18 and between distressed are more like between 18 and above. So that's the broader, uh, you know, categorization of the funds uh, modulus as a as a as a house, as a private credit shop is, is completely focused only on the performing credit uh, segment, which is at the upper end of the curve uh, uh, ahead of uh, special situations and distressed category. So that's how I would broadly define from your perspective as to when you select a fund as to how you should look at it and make that segregation. It just helps to take a decision a little bit more well informed and it's better. So, you know, uh, the foremost question that comes to my mind, you know, is that why will any good, good company come to an AIF to borrow money? Sure. So, uh, Kamal, that's a very interesting question. And again, that's, uh, you know, I think everybody just uh, asks me this, that if this company is so good that private credit funds are lending, why banks are not lending? Or why are these companies coming to private credit platforms? Is that does that mean that they are not getting money from elsewhere? Or for that matter, this one can also interpret that is risk very high in some of these companies. So let me explain uh, sort of our uh, little perspective on on it. Uh, but just in between, Kamal, can you hear me well? Absolutely, perfectly fine. Uh, okay, great, great. Okay, so. Uh, so I think uh, so that's that's something I would would like to cover that, you know, uh, why companies come to private credit funds and I'll try to cover all these three, four aspects. So first is, I think, uh, fundamentally, if you look at these corporates, which are which we say that we are performing or which we say are established, profitable, performing credit as a segment. So why would they come to, you know, to, to credit funds and borrow money? Of course, we are not. Uh, cheaper than banks. So, you know, uh, what's the real reason behind it and things like that. So first and foremost, I think uh, multiple reasons. But firstly, I think uh, if you look at, I think some of the times end use uh, of the money that you are borrowing is not really permissible under the central bank regulations. What does that mean? So, for example, as you know, banking sector is really governed by Reserve Bank of India. RBI has certain guidelines around where the money can be lent and how it can be used. So there are certain specified end uses where banks are not permitted to lend. What are those uses and why does it feel that credit funds can really lend to that? For example, if, if let's say there is a equity contribution that a company has to put in into a project. So uh, banks are fundamentally not uh, allowed or permitted to sort of contribute towards uh, equity injections. Second, for example, 
if let's say the entrepreneur the promoters of the company would want to increase stake buy out a jv partner or for that matter a private equity that has come into the company and maybe the private equity has sort of exhausted its fund life uh, you know and things like that and maybe the horizon at the base case was that they want to go in public and the markets are not good so some of these reasons sometimes wherever the permissibility of central bank is not there some of the end uses is really where the credit funds come and make a play so for example as you would have seen in the past uh, you know there are certain domestic m&a transactions where one company is trying to buy out another company so again if it that involves a purchase of shares etc so some of those requirements are not as i said allowed to be funded by banking system and and for entirely this reason they normally come to they have to come to credit funds to uh, you know borrow that kind of capital or to take that kind of capital and and continue with that transaction so that's one so that's a permissibility of end use is one big reason as to why good companies will also come to credit funds so that's number one second is if you look at any corporate for that matter when you look at its life cycle when you look at its trajectory over a 10 20 30 year period while the companies are around uh, there always there is a point of time in trajectory of any company's performance that uh, sometimes the macro environment is not conducive say for example if a company is into commodity nature if it's a cyclical in a company like say chemicals there is a time that comes in cyclicality of those sectors that the the prices are not conducive or for that matter the the macro environment is really not conducive the demand has shrunk etc so as a result of that what happens is sometimes good companies also face a little bit of cash flow liquidity issue or i would say that sometimes the cash flows are really not generated uh, in, in 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 a context where it services all their obligations and people would want to sort of keep a war chest people would want to keep a precautionary capital people would want to borrow money which sort of repays their debt on time and things like that so second reason is which is what i call the realignment of capital structure where companies as i said they are never linear over a 10 20 30 year period and 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 because of that there is a time or there is a point of time in those corporates that come where the cash flows that they generate or cash flows that they are generating in that year are not fully capable to service their debt obligations as a result what happens then they will suppose to come out of their banking consortiums and borrow money from nbfcs etc and as a, and as you would have seen that you know corporate nbfcs are little bit far and few today and this entire setup is now being done really by credit funds so some of these end uses are really being done by these uh, credit funds what i'm trying to say is that that there is you know the 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 private credit funds are really catering to category of corporates which have and in the performing credit segment especially where fundamentally these companies are good they have good business models they have been around and running for a longish period of time but because of either a macro cycle not in their favor or because of some capacity addition for example that they have made and as a result of multiplicity of factors you know their cash flows that they are generating are not fully adequate to service the liabilities at that point of time the banking system normally feels constrained to lend to you and at that point of time these kind of transactions are really done by credit funds now uh, which obviously uh, you know and that's the reason that private credit funds have essentially been set up and not to sort of uh, and banking system as you see is also taking certain category of risk today so banking system as a, if you see how we have sort of recalibrated in in banks today banks are generally taking risks which are more shorter end of the curve more shorter term nature of financings and things like that and also they're concentrated in a in a portfolio and corporate assets which are much more high grade in nature for example the credit ratings of more like triple a and double a is where banking sector corporate loan profile or corporate loans exposure is more concentrated in that sector and as a result there is a huge 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 segment of companies which are outside of that credit rating and would normally come to credit funds and borrow money so what i'm trying to say in summary in short 
credit funds are really catering to broadly three, four end uses. One, wherever the end use are not permissible by central banks. Second, because of some reason or the other, the cash flow profile at, at a point of time in the company's life cycle and performance is sort of looking like that cash flows are not adequate. And third is that, as I said, realigning of capital structure and things like that is where the, the private credit funds are really making a play. Sure, Akshat. So, you know, obviously this all sounds to be very uh, uh, interesting at the same time, raises a lot of uh, doubts in minds in terms of a lot of risks involved because, you know, this is something, you know, as it, it is being said as a structure of private credit. Hence, it is important to understand how is deal structured, you know, how the risk is managed because when you are privately lending to a corporate, that borrowing could be a special situation or could be not, you know, for a long term. And, you know, you could be having a lot of, I would say, uh, faith and trust on that corporate because the corporate size is large. But at the same time, you know, risk in future is always uncertain. And hence, how you structure that deal, how do you take collaterals? And at the end of the day, if things go wrong, how do you ultimately get money back? You know, if you could, could throw some light on that in terms of the overall process that you follow, that will really help. Again, uh, uh, thanks, Kamal, for this question. Very interesting. You know, uh, I always say that investments is not only about investing. It is also about risk management. So again, uh, in all these investments, uh, there is a certain category of risk that the fund is taking. Now, what is this risk? Uh, uh, how do we manage risk? How do we monitor risk and how do we exit risk? I think broadly, if you look at that three, four aspects. So, you know, whenever we make these investments, uh, you know, depending upon a specific underlying company, uh, there is always, uh, uh, you know, a specific tailored made uh, capital solution that is provided to the company. And that is done after a thorough, deep, detailed credit due diligence that normally comes but 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 before that if you look at i think as i said in my previous comment uh, or the previous question that all these companies are good companies but they are coming from a point of time that they need capital and because of the absence of capital at the otherwise in banking systems and otherwise they come to you so at, at so fundamentally there is always uh, you know a point of time when these companies come to you in the credit funds there is a there is an implicit understanding that uh, you know there is a better security package there is a better risk profile that you have to really create in terms of the risk mitigants when you sort of borrow from a credit fund so that's a general premise at which you normally start off with second point is that obviously each investment is uh, to its uh, specific tailored made end use but uh, the way any life cycle of a credit risk is being managed is that obviously after a detailed thorough due diligence, I think you uh, take a proper uh, recourse to certain cash flows where you sort of think that the uh, money will really get paid back. There is a proper collaterals that you normally take as part of every transactions. And these collaterals are not just paper collaterals. This is a proper security that you take for any lending transactions, whether it's a real estate whether it's collateral of listed and listed securities, whether the company's assets, etc. But there is a proper security collateral package that's really uh, part of every credit transactions, which gives you a reason to believe that, yes, in case of any eventuality, in case of any unforeseen circumstances, there is a end of the day you are doing debt. The, you know, the whole premise of fixed income is that in case there certain things don't work out as per the cash flow mechanism, there is a security that you can lay your hands to. So, you know, the enforceability of security, uh, the time taken to enforce that security, how easy it is to liquidate that security. I think some of these things have to be factored in very well. Moving on, I think a large part of the reliance is really given to the fundamental cash flows of the underlying company, that how is the cash flow profile of the company and what is really the cash flow that is really paying you back. The point is that it is not the security that's paying you back. So, you know, analysis of that cash flow, escrowing certain stream of cash flows, taking a comfort on a set cash flows generated by the business. If there was an issue, as I mentioned in my previous uh, question, 
that you know uh, company is going through a little bit of macro factors so you know when is the turnaround expected in that sector so you know the same way which let's say any investor in any company would have invested analysis of that company is how we also do it so whether you do debt whether you do equity or whether you invest in a company the analysis remains same the idea is the fundamental business model should throw up cash flow and they should be returned to the shareholders or there is a return to the promoters that normally you see as part of your subjectivity of uh, investing in any credit transaction so this is how basically the risk is really getting uh, you know addressed which is number one just to summarize one is that you know lay your hands on cash flows cash flows is the king and cash flows it should be completely be ring fence and escrow to sort of ensure that it's you sort of get exit on a timely basis and another thing about cash flows is that look once you have a once you have a handle on the cash flows it could go up and down but it just that it's not a very binary that it would suddenly you know vanish and it will become a zero sum one game so one is cash flows uh, you know and as i said cash flows are very critical for managing risk in a transaction and ensuring that your credit investment really gets paid over a period of time from this from this cash flow fund second is as i said i think making sure that your security collaterals are very very appropriate they are enforceable they can be can be resorted to on a rainy day and it's not only that it exists on a piece of paper third i think which is very important how do you manage risk is to making sure that you are on top of your investment monitor your sectors well monitor the underlying companies well making sure they are sort of you know you stay on top of your situation in terms of how they're operating and financial performance has been either on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis depending on company to company investment to investment so these things are really very critical in how would you sort of manage risk and contain risk in a transaction uh, and that's how uh, you know we would sort of try to say that you know look uh, these are certain risks that you identify and you mitigate risks in any specific situation suppose you know there are you know the takeout is say to an equity event takeout is say through a for example a asset monetization or for example as i said that takeout is really through a cash flow you have to go and see that you know, what is the cash flow coming what is the nature of that cash flow what is the risk that the cash flow may not happen so for example as i said there is a equity event so you should see that look is the equity coming on time is it where are the equity investors who will sort of put in money as equity and things like that so you have to go to the to the basics at a ground level and see that how the 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 exit is really secured and it, and is being done on a timely basis but some and substance of all these investments is really about monitoring i think if you monitor your investments well you stay on top of it you have a tight control and tight monitoring mechanisms or with all your credit conditions and credit monitorings i think you know a risk is fairly contained and monitored well sure rakshat so can you take few examples of you know uh, companies where you would have done lending in the past to explain the uh, you know uh, process and also uh, cover that how did you find those companies you know what is the uh, way to kind of source those Uh, names or those companies do they approach you or you approach them how does that work so uh, so kamal the way i would say that uh, from our perspective uh, you know we are a, uh, a little bit more sectoral focused fund which then what it at any point of time i think our investment philosophy has been more uh, governed by macros or sectors in which the, we normally have strong growth and have tailwind uh, with that what happens is that let's say we have picked up a sector called healthcare which we think that is growing at between 20 to 40% depending on which part of healthcare you are in and which helps us to sort of filter in a particular sector as i said and then filter in and zoom in into the the companies that are part of that sector so that's a little bit more on the reverse origination strategy that you know we we'll, we would want to sort of pick up corporates or companies in the segment where we are feeling strong about that particular macro environment around that sector second is i think uh, you know uh, uh, it happens both ways generally that you know funds that have to invest capital obviously keep tracking based on their their preferences as i mentioned 
on a particular sectors etc and generally uh, you know companies also who are in that situation would need capital would also directly and directly try to reach you they will appoint an investment bank they would appoint an advisor they would sort of have a private equity in the company when private equity will probably reach out to you so the 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 origination or i would say how a credit fund get access to some of these transactions it works both ways uh, for us as i said uh, uh, you know focusing on a particular sector and otherwise also i think uh, you know companies do reach out directly or through their investment banks and advisors as well now uh, the other is uh, the other question that you really asked is in terms of let's take few examples and maybe talk you through it so uh, i'll give you two examples let's take one example in fund 1 and maybe let's take one in in fund 2 so uh, in fund 1 we had looked at this company called uh, you know vocard limited uh, uh, and in second fund let's maybe we'll take some other company but let's talk about vocard vocard has been around uh, it's a, it's a well known pharmaceutical company based out of bombay it's been around for some time so i think when we looked at this company i think during uh, post covid etc i think their working capitals were a bit stretched because of um, you know what had happened outside of covid and they had also had an aggressive growth plan in terms of certain drug discoveries which had to got off a little bit of pause because of macro environment that got created out of uh, you know covid as a result there was a need of uh, equity injection in the company uh but at that point of time if you would have gone on uh, and raising equity that may not have sort of fructified into a success when we looked at this company as i said we have been we, we sort of pharma is a one of our core sectors so when we had looked at this company what we saw uh, is as follows we saw a very strong drug discovery pipeline we saw uh, there some of their you know offshore location especially uk etc uh, had sort of long term contracts to sort of Uh, you know, especially from serum, etc., on the fill and finish vaccine, etc. So what I'm saying is that there is a, a fairly large company established for a long time, well known to the financial fraternity, had a certain certain specified end use, uh, which otherwise could not have met by a banking system, uh, and hence there was a need for a credit fund. Moving on, how do you lend? And how do you contain risk? And how are you exiting? so i think this was a lending to the company and as i said some of these end uses that we sort of mentioned uh, when you looked at these companies i think then you know you have to work out a proper cash flow mechanism so there is a stream of cash flow that we sort of escrow to uh, to our fund in terms of certain revenue from a certain uh, pockets of uh, uh, segment sales which we have sort of escrow so there is a there is a cash flow profile that you would probably identified and that was earmarked to yourself in terms of security it was a combination of uh, listed shares assets of the company and some real estate i think we took it as a combination and as you see but fundamentally the hypothesis around that investment was that uh, there is an impressive drug discovery pipeline second is that the uh, uh, you know very good orders around vaccine from uh, you know very very pe- pedigreed and reputed uh, uh counter parties uh, so they had to require some bit of capital injection to sort of uh, you know meet that demand and then coming on that was sort of the hypothesis on which basically you lent so if you look at the trajectory of our investment we had lent a significant amount in this uh, you know in this company and as you can see recently i think the company has done an equity issue uh, it was a straight equity issue and 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 very very Uh, marquee investors have sort of subscribed to the equity of this company which just validates our own risk assessment philosophy and how we work and how we monitor risk and as you can see that uh, obviously we are now on the end of fund 1 and you know this investment is almost at the fag end of getting fully paid off so that's the type of investments that we really look at and that's how we what is the end use where is the money getting used what is the security profile how do you get paid out how do you ring fence your 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 investment and how do you finally work towards an exit so that's one investment i think um, you, you know i would take another investment very quickly uh, keeping in view of the time uh, you know we've invested in a um, in a company called uh, you know it's a company in auto engineering space called it's a delhi based company 
uh, called Shivam Auto. Uh, the family has got uh, two very large companies. It's in one is auto engineering, Shivam Auto, second is Manjal Shoba. So the company is really manufacturing gears uh, for motorcycles around for 10, 20 years. In fact, more than that, I think, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they moved into four wheeler. And as a result, uh, they had borrowed money from for a project financing from banks. Uh, but as uh, you know, macro cycles normally dominate sometimes uh, uh, a, a point of time that when the capacity addition really came up, uh, uh, the auto cycle was not in their favor as a result, but the debt started to get mature. So this was a transaction which was realigning the cash flows of the group and taking in view that, yes, there will be a growth from the four wheeler segment. So I think, again, I think we're very happy with that investment. Very, very pedigreed group based out of Delhi. Uh, the, pro the performance of the company has been over, you know, quite some time. And I think it has been a steady growth month on month. Uh, and it's all in the price of the stock as well. So I think, you know, that's the kind of companies that you normally take. Uh, very well collateralized uh, investment directly at the company level. Again, identified a stream of cash flows that will sort of pay you out. So again, I'm just trying of trying to summarize our, our discussions around private credit is really that, you know, I think the, the in short, I think what you're really looking at is fundamentally good companies around for a long time. They're established companies. Uh, they know how to do their business. They have been performing for a very long time. But because of one reason or the other, sometimes the performance is not never in a linear trajectory. Sometimes they do go and get two cycles. And I think that's the opportunity. And that's the space that credit funds are sort of filling in and uh, sort of meeting the demands for certain certain of these corporates. Uh, and, and, you know, companies would borrow money for their growth. And as you can see, some of these investments that we have made, the two examples that I have shared with you, I think both these two companies are really coming in from a point of view that they would want to grow from where they are today. And, they have, you know, uh, they have resorted to private credit capital and sort of bridging the gap towards equity. Work hard did the same thing. I mean, borrowed money from us. And when the timing was right, they did a large equity issue. And some of these companies eventually then pay money back from their operating cash flows because there's a strong uptick. Or for that matter, they normally raise equity and things like that or go back to their banking system. So that's broadly how private credit is, how you would sort of summarize in some of these corporates and how the risk gets contained, where do we lend, etc. No, sure, Akshat. You know, I would have interviewed many fund managers in the private credit space. I think the way you have answered this question is very interesting and very insightful and very confidently that, you know, makes me ask subsequent question that because the space is quite wide. And as you explained in the very first, uh, you know, part of this webinar, various types of fund managers in private credit, if you may want to, you know, use that slide and explain, you know, where does modulus alternates kind of uh sit in the entire spectrum of you know various products and what is the what sure. is your so, position uh, what is your differentiation okay kamal can you put up the presentation somehow i am not able to put up the presentation yeah but, absolutely uh, you can, but can you I'll, I'll, I'll address it uh, can, you please, can you you can yes yes i can see that okay got it got it okay so uh, uh, let the slide come, but uh, but I think you know. Look, as I as I you know uh, was mentioning earlier, uh, the uh, you know the landscape looks uh, fairly wide today uh, in terms of uh, just one second. Let me just get to the right slide. Uh, Is this in the beginning or in the end? It's in uh, actually I'm looking at just one second. It will just give me a second. It's a little bit in the beginning. Yeah. So sorry about the delay. Uh, so look, I think, uh, as I mentioned, I think, uh, you know, just as a little bit precursor, 
I think uh, we started this business about six years back. I mean, I think we started private credit uh, at a time when I think it was pretty uh, new as an asset class. And I'm talking really about 2018 when I think it was a little bit uh, fairly unheard. And uh, uh, and with that, you know, you know, we have done fund one now doing fund two. But if you look at the landscape today, I think uh, you see about 20 odd funds currently being there. Uh, at a you know at a at a height or an optical level at you will see i think there are a lot of credit funds but when you actually look a little bit more granularly uh, you know you will sort of figure out that a uh, lot of these credit funds are uh, are developing their own niches or for that matter they are focusing on a certain segment and which what i call performing special sets and distress so i think one is that first point modulus is positioned only on the performing credit as a segment as an asset class second is that uh, you know uh, you know i don't see that uh, you know that considering that there are a lot of credit funds today but if you sort of add all the credit funds put together and you look at the size that they're operating i think that is just the tip of what the total demand of the private credit today is i mean just to give you certain numbers uh, you know india uh, if you look at i think just the total loans in the India in the banking system today is roughly about 450 500 billion dollar in terms of the total corporate loans that you see even if you take out 70 80 percent of it which is really the triple a double a if you take out companies that are doing extremely well and they don't need capital even if you take that just 10 percent of it is really the private credit universe then also you would look at a very sizable opportunity that still sort of exists. And this is really where what I call the latent size of the economy itself. We are just sort of ignoring the growth or the huge capex cycle that the country is sort of witnessing. So I see that, you know, look, first is the demand drivers of, of, of private credit. So uh, the growth side of the things, uh, you know, that's one. Second is the existing size of economy. And I think there's a fair bit of domestic consolidation that you really keep seeing, which adds to the demand drivers of private credit. Coming back, if you look at modulus, I think we, we, as I said, are really focusing on performing credits as a segment. And we have not drifted from our investment strategy. Our fund one has was focusing on the same performing credit and our fund two is really a replica of that. Uh, and we see that, uh, you know, I think there is a space and I would say that for a same number, probably more, uh, credit funds to probably come and make a play in India because I think the size of the opportunity is really humongous. So that's the first thing I would want to say that, you know, look, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, while there are a lot of credit funds, but I think if you, if you, if you dissect it based on people's expertise, based on where they want to be on the risk return profile, you would not see too many credit funds in relation to the total opportunity that really sits out sits in the country today i think that's the point that i'm trying to convey that uh, you know the number of credit funds the total size of the capital that they all manage is very less compared to the demand that you are seeing uh, out today and which is only going to grow from here uh, you know in addition to the existing latent size of the entire debt universe that you have today so that i think is really uh, uh, you know, about where the modulus is positioned. Second is what I would call uh, Kamal is that uh, I think, uh, you know, as I said, we have sort of had a fairly good run uh, in fund one, uh, just to talk about modulus a bit. I think uh, uh, in fund one, we have done 1800 crores just on numbers. Uh, that is a mix of blind pool capital and, uh, you know, our other investors who we manage capital. Uh, uh, I'm happy to state that in a period of uh, six years, we have had a very consistent performance. Uh, we have not had a share of volatility even in a single quarter uh, across. So, you know, very, very consistent performance. Our numbers broadly stack up as, uh, you know, our, our fund has been tracking between 16 to 17 percent on gross basis and our uh, pre-tax investor returns our pre-tax investor returns of investors are generally between 13 to 14 percent so i would say lowest is 13 maybe highest is 14 14 quarter median would be 13 half so i think we had a good run we made investment in 15 odd companies we have exited 11 uh, the balance four investments are also on the verge of getting fully exited in next five months 
in next five months, which is September 30th, later this year, the entire capital on fund one will be fully sort of uh, being returned to investors. Uh, so that way, I think the fund has sort of performed well. Uh, we are doing fund two now. Uh, we have been at it for, uh, I would say, this is the third quarter uh, in succession. Uh, we have already deployed 600 odd crores in fund two. Already the invested capital is 600 crores. We have seen broadly three quarters of performance and the fund is also tracking at 16%. So that way, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think what has helped us, uh, you know, is what I would say is, uh, I think staying on course, I think our investment strategy is really well articulated. There hasn't been any drift. We want to do performing credits. We are in performing credits and there hasn't been any drift. Second is, I think it's also about what we want to do, what we don't want to do. So we are very clear of what we don't want to do. For example, we don't do real estate. For example, we don't do deep dive infra. We don't do early stage businesses. We don't do technology. I think the focus has continued to be very, very, uh, you know, on the core economy and brick and mortar sectors. I think that has helped us to stay on course. How I explain to you that, look, I think we try to look at sectors uh, which has strong tailwinds. And I gave you an example of healthcare. I think these things really has helped the, the team, the investment team and the decision making uh, uh, has sort of also been facilitated to that extent. So that's that's number two. Number three, I think we have cho chosen our spots very carefully. I think we have looked at certain sectors uh, or certain companies at the right time. For example, I think uh, uh, we have looked at in 2018, 19, uh, we were very bullish on cyclicals and commodities and we made certain bets. Moving on, we we sort of moved to pharma. Uh, again, I touched upon an investment that we did in fund one, which is work hard. So it was not design. It was just sort of, uh, you know, just not being opportunistic. It was that we wanted to do pharma. And, and we picked up our spots, right? Within that, we picked up companies well. And to that extent, I think, uh, you know, we have sort of performed well from that perspective. The other is, I think the last point, I think I would I, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, where modulus makes a difference and where modulus has sort of uh, 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 what if I would sort of look at what has been a success for modulus and what has been a learning is really about monitoring, which I've always believed in it that, you know, uh, you know, staying on top of your credits, monitor your investments well. And I think uh, stay close to your situations where you have invested. I think that has really helped the team in making sure that exits happen on time. Uh, among the 11 exits that we have made, as you can see on the slide in front of you, if uh, you know if, any, if anybody pays attention, is that 10 investments have got paid ahead of schedule. So I think that's that's another thing that I would want to sort of mention that you know when you are staying close to your situations, you're top of your credits. I think some of these companies that do well, then of course you know you you sort of get paid a little bit ahead of time and things like that. So just in short, I think one, the overall track record and performance and the seasoning of the team uh, is, is point number one that, you know, that sort of uh, why modulus from that perspective. Second is, I think uh, uh, I always say that, you know, look, uh, you know, uh, return of capital is a very, very important barometer that, you know, look, you've taken money, you have anchored investors at a certain point of time. You have sort of been a very consistent performer returning capital on time. With, with, with a very consistent performance has been sort of our sort of sweet spot. Uh, the other is, as I said, uh, you know, just staying course on your investment thesis and last is monitoring. I think some of these three, four things uh, sort of have differentiated us from others uh, and uh, sort of uh, I think investing is also, as I said, avoiding a lot that you don't want to do. So I think that's how I would want to summarize. And that's really where we think that modulus uh, you know, has uh, has sort of has played or sort of had delivered a very consistent performance. Sure, Akshat. One last question, you know, that I wanted to cover, I could see, you know, uh, presentation also is the people behind Modulus Alternates. You know, what is what 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 are what are the backgrounds of those people? What is the team like? What is your personal skin in the game? And you know. Uh, overall committee investment committee and their experience sure so uh, you know in terms of uh, uh, the people uh, you know uh, uh, I'll, I'll start from the beginning i think as i said i started this business six years back 
so modulus was completely uh, formed by myself uh, uh, we have two uh, main shareholders uh, in the group the main parent shareholder is the wider centrum group uh, and centrum is uh, you know uh, the executive chairman of centrum is jaspal bindra who is uh, you know very well known in the financial fraternity uh, the second shareholder is uh, a gentleman uh, who's recently got uh, you know come on board a gentleman called mr alok agarwal uh, uh he is uh, you know a gentle you know he was the former cfo of reliance industries and he's been an ex banker himself in the first 81 to 93 uh, years uh, so he's again very well known uh, very well experienced uh, and you know him joining the as a shareholder and as a key driver of our business in terms of overall strategy vision etc i think is very helpful so two main shareholders with alok being the uh, prime driver of this business uh, second is if you look at the board uh, today at modulus uh, mr vinod rai uh, former bureaucrat and uh, former cag head former finance secretary uh, is the chairman of modulus uh, board i think he brings immense experience with him in terms of uh, uh, governance framework disclosures uh, you know what regulators are looking and feeding and how making sure that our fiduciary capacity or the fiduciary nature of our duty is fully complied uh, i sit on the board as a as a full time director uh, and we have one uh, nominee from centrum group uh, on the on the on the board uh, in terms of our decision making process uh, we have uh, you know as i said we fundamentally look at companies which have been historically part of banking frameworks and they go back so there we you know by design we have uh, made it a very banking heavy uh, investment committee so we have two gentlemen who from uh, uh, you know uh, banking frameworks one is mr rao he was the former deputy managing director at state bank of india and he served for more than four decades and in his last role he was heading the entire wholesale uh, uh, corporate accounts group at state bank of india so comes with a lot of experience around uh, you know commercial lending mr kamath uh, was former chairman of punjab national bank again very well known works with uh, you know few private equity as well um, uh, again has been there with us since inception uh, very helpful very well experienced uh, jaspal bindra uh, himself sits on the investment committee i mean uh, he's been around for almost four decades now and i think he brings plethora of experience in terms of lending to corporates knowing about corporates uh, whole ecosystem of entrepreneurs and promoters i think that corporate connect is very very strong and is very deep so that's uh, on the investment committee uh, there are another two people which i would want to talk about one is mr S uh, sadanand and one is mr anup krishna uh, mr sadanand there was former md ceo of sbi pension so again very senior money uh, very senior sorry about this uh, very senior person has managed significant capital at uh, sbi pension uh, and uh, uh, you know i think we really are sort of looking uh, the team uh, is sort of uh, you know sort of looking towards his experience in terms of his past uh, you know in terms of how he has managed such a significant capital at sbi pension uh, we have another gentleman called mr anup krishna he is again a you know state bank of india veteran uh i think uh, he really comes from the type of corporates that we really lend to so you know he was handling the mid markets group of sbi on a pan india basis so i think his corporate connects uh doing banking reference checks and you know uh, these companies that we lend to how have they behaved within the banking systems and how after our exposure will they go back to the eligibility of some of these companies to go back to banking systems is very critical so he plays a very critical role here uh moving on i think at our operating team uh, you know uh, we have a very full scale uh, investment team uh, in our fund uh, we are all together about a 15 16 member team uh, probably i think uh, you know the largest that you see around the street so that's bucketed around the investment team people who look after the operations processes governance uh, and other partner functions so our investment team is also uh, very well experienced we have very senior underwriters credit underwriters who have been with us for a long time 
all of them have actually uh, been uh, uh, comes from a past underwriting backgrounds uh, at and worked at very good places uh, so they together sort of look at you know combined experience of the team if you look at um, is is fairly more than 50 60 years i would say and i think uh, people are focused in the investment team from a particular sector or a particular number of deals etc but more importantly all these people in the underwriting team have underwritten credits in the past and have sort of monitored them very well uh you know as i said outside of investment team uh, you know uh, we have uh, the operating officer role in which uh, all the functions like governance processes operations uh, income calculation accounting finance etc so there's a large team that sort of functions as a back end support uh, and drives the whole governance and disclosure parameters and then we have certain compliance and you know other uh, other functions that are sitting within the team so i would say that you know if you look at modulus as a platform i think uh, we are a fully evolved ecosystem uh, is what i would say i think people at the helm for a group sort of take care from a shareholder perspective guys like alok and you know jaspal etc i think people at investment committee which again very very well experienced uh, you know i think somebody uh you know there's a lot to learn and you know they have seen multiple cycles and multiple decades of experience and being there at the helm i think uh, is is really the decision making that you see and i think coupled with the operating level team experience that we have i think it's sort of as i said uh, you know it's a full ecosystem of uh, of a, a very institutionalized system of we are working in the setup over to you kamal yeah perfect rakshat i am just stopping the slide i think this entire yes. you know uh, webinar has been very insightful i have as i said done multiple interactions with private credit fund managers and always had doubts but i think the confidence with which you have presented and kind of experience that we have had in the first fund where a lot of our clients are invested i can vouch that yes given the team's experience given the fund's experience given the target universe of companies that you are focusing and the list of do's and don'ts that you have mentioned absolutely the fund has a merit for sure uh, obviously there is nothing that comes you know uh, without risk but this fund takes care of risk really well thank you rakshit for taking out time today my apologies to you know everyone if there was any delay uh, or any lag at my end i'm sure there was i know that uh sorry you know for that and thank you so much for logging in no, no, that's all right uh, yeah. no no very helpful i think love to speak to your audience whosoever is there thank you everyone for joining in uh, i know we probably didn't had any questions or any interactions but you know in case uh, if anybody has any questions happy to take that or if there's any kamal if there's any hands up or something do let me know if there is anything that we need to answer sure sure absolutely you know i i i could see you know, there were sort of no no we are not short of time absolutely so there there are you know few questions but i think more or less we have covered like you know one question is what is the size of the current fund has this become a crowded market so are these particular time period during which these funds work so you know will these generate returns in stable or declining year no so i think uh, you know So I think this one I'll take. Are there particular time periods during which these funds work and things like that? So I think uh, Ashish Mehrotra. I mean, I think it's an interesting question. Let me try to attempt that. So I think uh, uh, we are at a macro cycle, uh, Ashish, that where the interest rates are globally high, and you know, and India as well. So you know, I think that makes all the more compelling reasons to sort of move the allocation to fixed income and to bonds. uh because i think currently we are experiencing uh, we are in the deployment phase of the capital in fund 2 and i think most of the capital will get deployed in next uh, ongoing and over the next 12 what months where we expect the interest rates to continue to remain elevated and which makes as i said a very very compelling case from a macro perspective to sort of invest second point is yes i agree with you that yeah, there are time periods that you should invest because again as i said i am a big believer of macro cycles 
so if you have uh, if you can catch the uh, elevated interest rate cycle uh, it's just like buying guilt funds today right i mean i think uh, anybody who buy guilt fund today will probably make money down the line over the next 2 to 5 years so yes there is a uh, you know a, a time period in the cycle of rate cycle that you should sort of uh, look at investing in these credit funds uh, your your other question will these generate returns in stable or declining yields uh, absolutely something that i buy today at 12% will automatically become tighter and on a declining interest rates so something that i buy at 12% today will automatically become 11% two years down the line so i will not only make a yield on the asset i will also make a capital appreciation on the investment and all the more reason that you know allocation to credit funds is very critical uh, and fixed income on the credit side at this point of time uh i think that sort of explains his uh uh, yes, questions. absolutely, absolutely, Akshay. So I think you know we have Kamal. Anything else? No, that's it. So you know the size of the fund you had already covered. That is the only unanswered question. But I want to maybe understand from you the size of this fund is going to be bigger than the last fund. Does the increase in the size of fund increase the risk of managing the larger corpus? And have you thought about that? How do you want to answer that aspect? Because that is the context behind asking size of the fund. So look, I think. absolutely yeah so i think first is we did fund one at 1800 crores that was a mix of blind pool capital and the other investors who we manage capital uh, we expect the fund to be between the two combinations would be of similar size as i said uh, the blind pool capital we expect to be about 750 uh, crores plus 500 green shoe and uh, along with other co-investors and blind pool the other managed capital i think we'll probably end up at a same number of 2000 2200 500 crores there about so as of now we are at 600 crores of total deployed capital across five investments uh, the fund is open for fundraising at this point of time uh, and we would sort of we expect i think we would probably you know uh, the visibility is very high i think we'll probably raise that kind of capital uh so it will be a similar sized fund as fund 1 just to answer the first question second is i think um uh, you know i mean i have sort of covered it many ways but i would again like to reiterate that you know look uh the sheer size of the economy the growth that india is seeing now in terms of really on the back of the capex that the government is doing uh and some private sector capex that is really happening it's not as widespread uh i don't see that there will be a, a a shrinkage or i would say a constant demand so i would say that demand of credit funds will continue to be high and in fact as i said i think there is uh, more and more credit funds that will come to the street uh and uh, you know i i i feel that i we don't feel and we remain extremely confident that i think we will be able to deploy this kind of capital and maintain the uh the yield almost at par with our fund one uh now there is another question that i can see from falgun what is the minimum in investment amount yes uh, falgun it is um, sebi's prescribed limit is 1 crore you are right so that's a minimum amount that you have to invest from a sebi perspective your second question is once the deployment phase closes in 12 months does it mean i cannot get into this eif after that need to wait for the next fundraising exercise absolutely these funds are closed ended funds uh, as per the regulator sebi they allow you a window to raise capital so you have to raise capital in that window uh, and after that the fund achieves final close and after that you cannot raise more capital after that if you have to invest i am sure we will do fund 3 but people can come in fund 3 as well but uh, you know we are uh, we are sort of uh, raising capital now uh, we can always get into an offline discussion and talk more specifics but yes uh, there is a first close and final close after the final close you can't do that and we expect the final close to be somewhere around end of this calendar year nearing that right rakshat i think we have covered almost all the questions that any client or any investor would have on their mind but still is there any unanswered questions 
we will uh, you know uh, again do this webinar because i see there is continued interest because investors have had massive wealth creation with equities and now they want to preserve some component of that wealth yes please please over to you you want to say something there is one question uh, mr nikunj rawal has asked what would be cycle of returns so uh, uh, nikunj the way it works is that the income that the fund generates is distributed on a quarterly basis so it's a quarterly income distribution product and we will start distributing income in fund 2 from september quarter this year and every quarter thereafter so that's one on your income on the fund on the returns in terms of your principal if that's also your question your principal starts coming to you in the last 12 to 24 months and uh, that's how your principal gets redeemed because uh, the fund has a certain fund raise period the fund has a certain investment period and the, then the fund towards the end has a certain return of capital as you can see in my fund 1 we did 1800 crores we have already returned 1100 and then next 6 700 crores is getting returned over the next 5 6 months perfect rakshad i think let's uh give the concluding remarks so obviously you know uh, your fund has some attraction i would not say a lot of attraction like investors and clients decide that and at the same time we know equity markets are at that level from where any new money could go to fixed income and at the same time as you rightly mentioned fixed income is also uh, attractive in its cycle because rates are high and yes now it depends upon investors overall portfolio to decide you know how much and what uh, in what capacity they want to invest in this space thank you rakshit for sparing time today i think this entire webinar was quite insightful and thank you everyone for joining us today we will again be doing similar webinar uh, you know uh, depending upon if we get more interest we had called rakshit because some of our existing clients who are considering to reinvest in the next fund wanted to hear him and thank you rakshit for taking time today once again thank you everyone thank you kamal and thank you everyone look forward to speaking you again thank you